My many thanks to the Ministry of Women, Family, and Community Development and to the Institute of Social Malaysia. It is an incredible honor to be amongst all of you today addressing this very important topic of mental health and women empowerment. Today, I would like to share with you a little bit about this work and share with you the work that we have been doing. I just need to have this, inshallah ta'ala. The work that we have been doing in the United States of America and at Stanford University related to this topic. Our topic today is her mind, her strength, women's wellness and empowerment. Before I begin, I would always so like to make sure that we give our thanks as thanks is due because we learn from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever does not thank the people has not thanked Allah. And for that reason, I would like to thank my lab, Rotori, that's in Stanford University, the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, of which much of what we are going to talk about today is directly from that research and that work. Now to begin, I have a question for all of you, and that is, how many here who would say that they have faced mental health struggles? A show of hands. Thank you for being so incredibly honest, mashallah. If I'm not mistaken, that is the majority of the hands in the room. And I too would raise my hand as well. May Allah bless you all. Now my next question is, how many of you have made efforts to alleviate these challenges informally? As in to say, friends and family, people who are your neighbors, your aunties, those who have, are basically non-professionals. How many of you would say that this is how you alleviate your mental health struggles? Thank you again for your honesty. And then in terms of for the others, how many of you would say that you alleviate your uh, mental health struggles formally, as in to say with mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, how many of us in the room would say so? What I'm noticing is a lot less hands. And this is very common, actually, in, in why we're having this discussion today. I hope, inshallah, that by the end of this knowledge learning session, a knowledge sharing session, that we're able to understand the importance of mental health, both formal and informal, inshallah. Now I would like to tell you a little bit about the work that we are doing as we look to the Malaysian context specifically. In the Malaysian context, if we look at the statistics that are there, you find that one in three Malaysians actually experience mental health issues. And the largest number are actually the adolescents, the young individuals, ages 16 to 19. Also those who are coming from low-income backgrounds. And this is very important for us to pay attention to, to think about how it is we form solutions, that these are two very important groups of people to work with directly. It could be financial difficulties or unemployment, it could be work-related stress or family discord, but the reality is the umbrella of mental health is very wide. And underneath it isn't just diagnosable conditions like you might think of depression or anxiety or trauma, but underneath this wide umbrella of mental health, we also include things like parenting, intergenerational struggles, between one generation and the next. Marriage, all of the different contexts in which a person may have any level of struggle actually fits into the mental health umbrella. And so with that, it turns out, this is why the majority of us raised our hand when I asked the question, how many of us have faced mental health challenges? Because the umbrella is quite wide. And then from there, we want to then look at some more difficult statistics. These are not easy to talk about, and I do issue my trigger warning, as in to say, for a moment here, I'm going to talk about some difficult things. And so if it is difficult for you to hear this, please take a moment for yourself and rejoin us when you're able to. As I look to a very difficult topic, which I myself tend to call the taboo within the taboo of mental health, is the discussion of suicide. Suicide, or taking one's own life, is the very end of the line of our mental health challenges and struggles. 
Oftentimes, as clinicians and researchers, we look to suicide attempts and death by suicide to understand how well is a certain community or country doing with their mental health conditions. In the COVID-19 pandemic, the rates of mental health challenges rose drastically, and so did suicide attempts and deaths by suicide. It was a very difficult time, I'm sure many of us here can agree, and a time of isolation and a feeling of despair or the anxiety around the unknown. When we look here to Malaysia specifically and compare it to other Muslim-majority countries, we find that it is actually the second highest country with suicide rates, which means we have some work ahead of us to do, and we are going to hopefully do all of this together. As we look then to mortality, meaning death by suicide, you can see the numbers here over the last 10 years have continued to increase slowly but surely. And what is missing is the data from the COVID-19 era in which, unfortunately, the numbers are even higher. Now, Malaysia is not alone in this context. The United States, where I am from, has actually similar numbers. In fact, the Muslim communities in America also have an increasing rate of suicide attempts. And this means that this has become a global issue. Mental health is, in fact, a human issue that many, regardless of your faith, your cultural backgrounds, your ethnicity, your social economic status, it affects all of us, in fact. I would like to take a moment now and share with you some work we have been doing in the United States with the organization that I have helped co-found called Madistan, and which I hope to speak to you a little bit more a little bit later. I was contacted by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the HHS. They said to me, we want to create a PSA, meaning a public service announcement, for the Muslim communities of the United States. However, we know that in order to access them, the most important voices are the trusted voices. Well, who are the trusted voices? In our American Muslim context, it is actually our religious leaders our imams and our shuyukh, our ustads and our ustadas. And so they tasked me with the task of contacting the big name imams and shuyukh and religious leaders of America to make a video on the new crisis line number for America, which for us is 988. When the US government moved the number to this new number a couple of years ago, to 988, they said, please help us get this information to the Muslim community. What I'm going to share with you next is the video, in fact, that we created on this topic, so you may have a sense of what we were able to do. If we can play the video now, please. One of my earliest experiences with the topic of suicide was actually the suicide attempt of one of my own teachers of the Dean. He was an incredibly versed scholar of Islam, a mufti and a hafiz of the Qur'an. We students were shaken to the core. We could not fathom or understand how someone who was so learned in Islam could attempt to take his own life. During the pandemic, I was contacted by a griefing parent asking me if I was willing to say a few words at her daughter's eulogy. Her daughter, at the age 16, had died by suicide. A few years ago, one of our daughters, who attended a local private Islamic school in the area, took her own life. Her desperation led her to believe that there was no way out. She was beautiful, smart, feisty. She was 12 years old. We cannot afford to pretend that this is not a problem in our community, or we cannot assume that this belongs to one demographic in the community. This is not a problem that is restricted to any particular age or any particular circumstance. There is such a thing that uh, a, a person is battling with suicidal thoughts 
uh, ideas that come that are not necessarily stemming from a lack of faith. No doubt, good faith and good family and good friends help, no doubt. But there is still such a thing as depression. I want all of us, all of us, to work together to end the stigma with mental health, to provide the help that our children need, especially young people. We have to refer people who are struggling, not just to the local imam, but also to, to train clinicians and therapists who can intervene medically and clinically. I encourage all of us to use 988 and have our community members, loved ones, and families do the same right in that moment of need. 988 offers 24-7 access to trained crisis counselors who can help. If you need suicide or mental health related crisis support or are worried about someone else, please call or text. To reach the lifeline, people can call or text 988 or chat online at 988lifeline.org. How did you find the video? <laughs> Thank you. It's definitely been a work in progress. And I hope that we're able to work with all of you here as well in Malaysia for similar outcomes. It has become very important regardless of our faith background, regardless of our origins and social economic status, to understand mental health from a universal perspective a human perspective. It is true that in many faith communities that the religious leaders play a very important role, which is why we contacted them specifically to give this important message. It is my hope, inshallah, God willing, that as we're able to progress in these discussions of mental health and mental wellness, things improve. However, it may be some time before they fully improve. And by that I mean, the new advances related to technology, to AI, artificial intelligence. It is very likely that with the new relations that are happening in uh, technological aspects, that we might have worsening mental health outcomes before we find better. The reality of holding in the very palms of your hand phones, tablets, in which information is coming at you into your feed constantly, and in which, for example, and we must note at this very moment, our sisters and brothers who are actually very much oppressed and under attack, Palestine and Lebanon and Syria and other countries at the moment, and all of our du'as go for the sisters and brothers of our ummah, the fact that we can see moment to moment what is happening in the very palms of our hands, is very difficult. In fact, the human being was not created to withstand such images of horrific atrocities. It is definitely having an impact on our mental health and wellness. Furthermore, as artificial intelligence continues to evolve, as deep fakes continue to happen, it will be very hard to distinguish what is real from what is not real. This too will have an impact on our, on our mental health and wellness. And so we want to utilize all the advances of technology to the best of our efforts, but we don't want it to harm us at the same time, and this is a tricky balance to strike. And so where do we go from here? Well, the conversation then, I'd like to turn to women specifically. Our conference and our discussion today is on women's empowerment and mental health, and you might wonder why. However, the reality is every time we have a, a program related to mental health, the majority of the people in the room are in fact women. You also find that the discussion, and, and we do welcome all of the men, thank you for being here. But at the same time, we want to say the importance of women in a society. By empowering her, you're empowering literally the entire society. Women make up half of our global societies and they raise the other half. And so by empowering women, you're also empowering everybody in essence. And so 
With, when we look at specific issues related to women, what we find, however, is often we are running ourselves empty. As in to say, we are nurturers by nature. So we give, we give, we give, we continue giving. However, we don't necessarily stop and refuel. And in that way, I worry about we running on empty and burning out. It also turns out that our tradition, the Muslim tradition that has in it universal principles that are beneficial to all people, I will draw today specifically from the Islamic tradition as that is my own background and for many in the room, but I want to emphasize the universality of the teachings of what it is that I'm going to share that is really beneficial to everybody. For example, there is a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, that says, verily, your own self has a right upon you. So, break your fast, pray, and sleep. As in to say, it's not that you are meant to be somebody who's constantly praying, constantly fasting, constantly up in prayer at night. There's a balance that must be struck. Also, we learn from our traditions, for women, they are decision makers so often. They play this role of influencing families and individuals, not just in their own household, but there is a ripple effect. And so if you're able to influence the woman and give her and empower her with strength and information related to mental health and other forms of health and well-being, you're going to be able to have a ripple effect. Secondly, when we look at many of the cultures and Muslim-majority countries, you find that there are traditional gender roles that sometimes put social pressures on women, and caretaking responsibilities tend to be one of them. Maintaining familial harmony is another one, and also kind of adhering to cultural norms. This also means sometimes masking or quieting stress, anxiety, or even depression. To maintain a strong face, or to then simply care for others in your family. You must, many people believe, have to not show your own vulnerability. However, this eventually takes a toll on women and on her entire family and community. Thirdly, I'd like to address the issue of stigma, which I'll come to later again in more detail. And specifically today, I want to address issues related to faith. So often we find that faith is a reason why people say that they're either uh, able to access mental health care or not. As in to say, some people believe psychology is too secular and it is not relevant to them. Others believe that if they have strong enough iman, faith, they should not have something like depression. However, that's simply not part of the tradition as I will show momentarily. It's not part of the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, nor the stories of the Prophets in the Qur'an, our Holy Scripture, that prove otherwise. Oversimplifying what we understand mental health conditions to be multifactorial, as in to say there are multiple factors as to why someone may end up with a mental health condition. Biology, genetics, environment, society around them, societal pressures, in addition to spirituality, it could be any over one overlapping concept of any of the above. Usually it's not just one thing that leads to a mental health challenge or condition. So if we look at things only from a spiritual faith lens, you lose the other aspects. And if you look at it only from a biological, scientific lens, you also lose the other aspects that contribute to mental health, which means that we need to look at this more holistically. And now I'd like to turn your attention to what it means to look at these Islamic values that are, again, universal in principle. I will be quoting a number of ahadith or narrations of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and also from the Qur'an to illustrate my points. First, I would like to draw your attention to a hadith in which there are two sahaba, two companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they are having a discussion, a dialogue amongst themselves. One of the Sahabis, Abu Darda, says to his other brother, Salman al-Farisi, and he says to him, I'm going to 
fast all day. I'm going to pray all night, and I don't need to get married. And his brother, said Manifatis, he corrects him, and he says to him, your Lord has a right upon you. Inna li rabbika alayka haqqa. Your self has a right upon you. Wa li nafsika alayka haqqa. And your family has a right upon you. Wa li ahlika alayka haqqa. So give each one your right. Fa'ati kulla di haqqin haqqa. And then this story reaches the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And at that point, the Prophet Muhammad says, Salman has spoken the truth. And that is how we receive the story of the two companions who are in private speaking to one another. And we learn this concept of balance. The prophetic sunnah is one of balancing all aspects. Your own self-care, your own worship and connection to God, and your family and society that you're responsible for. There were no reasons in the prophetic sunnah to isolate just one of these aspects. Another story for you that I think is very powerful and has been very meaningful to me. We look, for example, here to a story in which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sees a young Sahabi. And this young man is entering into the masjid and he wants to catch the prayer. He needs to pray. And so he rushes into the masjid, the mosque, and he does not tie his camel. And so the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, calls him back. And he says, come back, come back out. What are you doing? And he says, I have to go pray. And he says, what about your camel? And the man says, isn't Allah sufficient to take care of my camel? And this is where we get the famous hadith where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I'aqilha wa tawakkal. As in to say, tie your camel and trust in Allah. This is very important because the Islamic worldview, which again is relevant and universal, is that we are twofold. Our worldview is twofold. We rely on God and we take measures needed. We tie our camels. And so when we talk about professional care, mental health care, if we notice within ourselves or our family members that somebody needs help and assistance, it is not sufficient, nor is it enough in our tradition to just say, I'm going to make dua for them. I'm just going to make dua. You say, I'm going to make dua and I'm going to take them to get help and assistance because maybe I am not trained to be able to help them. This is the prophetic tradition. The tawakkul, or the dependence or reliance on Allah, is in conjunction with taking the steps and measures needed. Furthermore, there are many stories in the Qur'an of the prophets that talk about the struggles that they all have went through. Today I will share just one, because there are so many, but I'll share from the story of, that's found in Surah Yusuf about the prophet Jacob, Ya'qub, and his son Yusuf, Joseph, and how his father Ya'qub suffered greatly when Yusuf was lost. He didn't know exactly where he was, and as we know from the surah, that there was much, <laughs> much that happened in Yusuf's life until at the very end they were reunited. But in the meantime, the scholars say there was at least 40 years before they were reunited together. And in those decades, Prophet Ya'qub really suffered greatly. In fact, in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the condition of Ya'qub. He describes his grief and his sorrow, his intense amounts of crying, tears and tears, until, as Allah says in the Qur'an, وَبْيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ فَهُوَ كظيم. And his eyes turn white from grief that he had suppressed. And the people around him, his own family members, did not understand his grief. In fact, they gave him grief over it. They gave him a hard time saying, isn't this enough? Isn't it enough that you keep on crying and remembering Yusuf? Let it go, let it go. But the reality is, he is a father. And the loss of a son, in this case, not even knowing is he alive or dead, is so difficult. 
Now, let me ask the audience here a question. As a prophet of God, would we ever dare say the prophet Yaqub didn't have enough iman or faith? No. We know as a prophet of God, he had intense amounts of faith. So faith and sorrow or depression can coexist. Another question for the audience. Prophet Yaqub is a man. Today we have a conference about women. And it is often, as mothers, we raise our boys. And we often, in many cultures and customs, we raise our boys not to cry. In fact, when they cry, what do we say to them? We say to them, don't be a girl. We say to them, man up. Here is a man, one of the best of men, as a prophet of God, who is crying so intensely that literally his eyes turn white from grief. The scholars say, like a haziness, a loss of eyesight. Would we ever dare say, Prophet Yaqub was not man enough? I make these points, and maybe I am pushing the envelope a little bit here, but I make these points because for the many here who are Muslim and even from other traditions of Abrahamic faiths, we know these stories. We say these stories, we know these surahs, we know this concept, yet somehow there's a disconnect in our own families and our own customs and cultures. I encourage us, I encourage us to look at the prophetic traditions. And speaking of prophetic traditions, we'll come to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, very soon and look at his own vulnerability and sufferings and what to learn from them. Before we do so, I'd like to just make a point. You may think that in me bringing up the hadith and the Quran, that maybe I am pushing too much on spirituality and religion. You may think that I am saying we should always look at things from a spiritual lens. No, what I am saying is there must be balance between all the different aspects. I want us to take into account the biological because our tradition has no problem with science. We never had a fallout between science and religion as other societies may have. We want to make sure we look at the social, the spiritual, and the psychological. Altogether, you end up with a much more holistic understanding of the human psyche and how best to treat our conditions. So now back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A question about how did he deal with his own challenges. We know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as is said in the tradition of Islam, is khayri khalqillah, the best of all human creation. The scholars say that he is sabab khalq al He is the reason, literally, for the existence of this entire universe. This is the Islamic belief. Yet he was sent to us as a man, a human being, not as an angel, perfected. No, as a human being, the most perfect of all human beings, but still a human being, meaning with struggles, emotions, and difficulties, loss of children, in fact, every single one of his children, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, died in his lifetime except for one. He buried them all himself except for one. It tells us about the struggles and the strength and resilience that was taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad. And so he often would teach us that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for somebody, he actually afflicts them with trials. This may be counterintuitive, but it's very important to understand the Islamic tradition. Yusib minhu, literally, he afflicts them with trials. Why? It's a kind of cleansing. It's a kind of polishing. You will not be polished unless you're rubbed. And sometimes that rubbing is hard. It's difficulties. It's challenges. You can have someone like Prophet Yaqub who is deeply suffering yet deeply beloved to God. And this is the teaching of Islam, which I believe has universal implications. The trials and tribulations are also an expiation of sin, meaning in the Islamic tradition we believe that it actually forgives sin. 
So we don't see things as tragedies. We see them as a way of upliftment. Even in psychology today, the understanding of trauma. The newest research on this topic shows that you can have post-traumatic growth. That after a trauma, you can actually elevate and grow as hard as that trauma may have been. Also, we learn from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the saying, how wonderful is the case of the believer. There is only good for the believer. When prosperity attends to them, they express gratitude, shukr, and that is good for them. And when adversity befalls them, they endure patiently, and that is better for them. So we see this world in two ways. We understand that both potentially can happen, and we accept both. And now, a very famous story of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and I know for me personally, reading this narration has really changed my perspective on grieving, on sadness, on death, on bereavement, on grief. As I mentioned earlier, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lost all of his children except for one in his lifetime. And here is a narration of the loss of his own son, Ibrahim, who was a young child. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had Ibrahim in his lap as this young boy was taking the last breaths of his life. Imagine how difficult this scenario is. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, starts to cry. Tears start coming down his cheek. And it amazed the Sahaba, the companions, his companions who are sitting with him, and they literally ask him, O oh, Rasulullah, you cry? As in to say they were curious, they wanted to understand, is it okay to cry? Again, as a man, as a prophet. And this is when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said his famous words, Verily the eyes shed tears, inna al-ayna latadma'a. And the heart is grieved, wal qalb yahzan. But we do not say that except which pleases Allah. Wala naqulu illa ma yurudi rabbana. And then he looks down to his son Ibrahim in his lap and he says, We are saddened by your departure, O Ibrahim. Wali firaqaka ya Ibrahim, nahnu mahzunun. It is powerful, it teaches us. You can cry. This is natural. This is normative. This is how Allah created humans. And the heart can feel grief and sadness. There is no shame in this. But then look at the Blessed Prophet and the balanced tradition Islam strikes. It says, but we don't say other than that pleases Allah. As in to say, we don't push back on fate. We don't say, how come me? Why not someone else? Mm -mm, not our tradition. But we do understand that the departure of our loved ones is hard and difficult. And this is fully in line with the sunnah. And we're not meant to suppress emotions that Allah has created for us. Sometimes people believe that emotions are good or bad. There is no such thing as good or bad emotions. As in to say people think depression is bad and happiness is good. No, all emotions, the entire spectrum was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of us will experience some level of it on the spectrum for different parts of our life. What's important is how you deal with it, not the fact that you have some sadness or depression at some points in your life. And so we continue the story about regulating emotions. And here too, I believe these are universal principles that every faith and every background can benefit from. Look at the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad in which he talked about anger. Specifically, many of us know the narration that the Prophet wasallam said, if you feel anger and you are standing, sit down. And if you are sitting and you still feel angry, lie down. And another narration where he وسلم, said, anger is from the devil, and the devil is created from fire, and a fire can only be extinguished with water. So when one of you feels angry, go make wudu. My point in sharing these narrations that are very famous, and many people likely in the room know them, is talking about emotional regulation. 
We learn in our tradition, if you have an anger problem, if you're easy to anger, you must do something about this. You can't just sort of say, ah, this is how God created me. No, our tradition is twofold. We must take measures to address whatever issue nature or nurture came to us. Furthermore, for me as a physician, as a doctor, who works directly with patients, so often my patients will say, the doctor, do I really have to take medicine? The doctor, do I really have to have this diagnosis? As in, they feel a sense of shame about the conditions they may have. And I remind them, again, a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, with universal values, in which he says to the people who are his companions who are asking him, is it okay to get treatment if we fall sick, if we fall ill? And to that he answers, ما أنزل الله دا أن إلا أنزل له شفاء. And in another narration, he literally says, تداو يا عباد الله تداو O servants of God, seek out treatments, medicines. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَضَعْ دَاءً إِلَّا وَوَضَعَ لَهُ الشِّفَاءً That Allah does not send down an illness except that He sends with it treatments. And the only condition that does not have a reversible treatment is old age. Sorry, we can't have an elixir of youth, apparently, mashallah. But we can find treatments for everything else. And when COVID-19 pandemic happened, I was really heartened when I would hear people from the Muslim community reassure one another with this hadith and say, look, if Allah sent us COVID-19, maybe right away in the first few months and even for you in the first year, we didn't know what to do with it. But reassuring us, if God sent down an illness, he is also sent its treatment. And they don't fall from the sky. And now I speak as a researcher. It is so important and imperative that we take efforts, that we do scientific experimentation, that we spend resources and investments in figuring out how do we treat the issues that we're seeing in front of us. And I'm very glad that many of us today are able to be in a room this large, mashallah, unmasked, as in to say we were able to move forward from the COVID-19 pandemic. Truly, if God sends down an illness, he sends with it either a treatment or cure. Furthermore, for those who might be wondering about what I said about medications, and for many of my patients who get stuck on this issue and say, I, I get it, I might have depression or anxiety or OCD or phobia or so on, but I don't really want to take medication. I remind them of another story. And this time it is a teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to his blessed wife, Sayyida Aisha, radiallahu anha where he teaches her that if she sees in the community someone who is grieving, who is depressed, who is sad, and particularly postpartum, after delivery of a baby, the sadness that may afflict, actually the research is one in five women, which means many of us in this room likely have had a postpartum depression, that she is meant to take to them something called a talbina, Salvina was a dish made from barley, milk, and honey. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that Talbina helps the ailing heart cope, and it relieves sorrow and grief. Even the companions wondered about this, and they asked Sayyida Aisha, why do you take something like Talbina to somebody who is depressed? And she said, this is what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught me. To me as a psychiatrist, this is very interesting. You see, she's giving it to cases of depression, grief, not feeling well, yani emotional and psychological conditions, that she's giving them something oral to take by mouth, to eat. There is no issue in our tradition to take by mouth something like a medication for an emotional or psychological condition. If it turns out that that is what the science and research today has showed is helpful for a certain condition. There's no issue in our Muslim tradition to push back on medications. Furthermore, we know from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he often would feel a sense of relief in prayer. 
In the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us that he has created us human beings in an anxious state. He's created us anxious. In Surah Al-Ma'arij, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have been created anxious. Think about that for just a moment. Think about it for just a moment. Humans are created anxious. And then Allah Azza wa Jal explains what to do with that anxiety. And one of the main things that is emphasized in that surah about anxiety is, and he says, إِلَّا الْمُصَلِّينَ Except those who pray consistently, powerful. And so it is no surprise that you have the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, telling Bilal, his companion, who would call the Adhan, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Relieve us from this anxiety, O oh Bilal. Allow us to enter into prayer and relieve ourselves from a sense of heaviness that comes upon us. Again, we are addressing a multi-faith room, understanding there are people from all different backgrounds here. Prayer, however, is universal. Something you may pray differently than I might pray. However, prayer carries its weight. And for so many people across the globe, prayer is a coping mechanism, a positive coping mechanism that they tap into. Looking at the Quran and the Sunnah, is there any contradiction with what I'm saying and with medical science? It turns out that actually it is powerful. And today science has proven so many research studies that having religion and spirituality as part of your coping mechanisms actually is helpful. But there is no issue to be able to have dua along with action. There is no problem in having tawakkul, reliance on God, and seeing your doctor or therapist. It also turns out that when we look at healthy coping mechanisms versus unhealthy coping mechanisms, you see that in addition to things like exercise, eating healthy, seeking professional help, right, problem-solving techniques, all of these are useful in addition to that spiritual aspect. Whereas unhealthy coping mechanisms, using drugs or alcohol, overeating, procrastination, sleeping issues, social withdrawal, self-harm, aggression, all of these are not going to be healthy. And so when we look at the healthy coping mechanisms, we want to make sure that we are consciously using them. Furthermore, self-care habits. And when I say self-care, so often people get stuck on hearing me say selfish. I'm not saying selfish. I'm saying self-care. Everything from the religious aspects like the dua and Qur'an, going to the masjid and prayer as we already mentioned, but walking, exercise, nature, socializing, good sleep hygiene. It turns out that every mental health condition is bettered by good sleep. And every mental health condition is more detrimental with poor sleep. What else? Mindfulness. This is so common today as one of the practices that are often prescribed. And it turns out that this is also deeply connected with the Islamic tradition as well. We know that mindfulness is going to reduce anxiety, depression, blood pressure, insomnia. And the interesting thing is it's a moment of pause and relaxation in your busy day. What do I mean by that? Look at Islamic mindfulness, for example. Those of you who are familiar with the concept of muraqaba, literally to watch, observe, or regard attentively. In the Islamic context, we are taught to take ourselves to account before we're taken to account, and to do this on a daily basis. If you look at some of the practices of how to do Islamic mindfulness, or what I like to call contemplative meditation, the concepts of tafakkur, contemplation, pondering the meanings of the Qur'an and the signs around you in the world, tadabbur, and dhikr, tadakkur. It's powerful what you can accomplish even in a busy lifestyle. I come from Silicon Valley in California. It is busy, busy, busy lifestyle. And if you do not take moments of pause and relaxation in your day, 
everything will catch up with you and it will affect your mental health and wellness. Furthermore, I'd like to tell you something that is helpful to me, especially in this year that has been so incredibly difficult on our ummah and on so many people globally and around the world. I have learned from my own spiritual teachers something called the three R's. The three R's, to retreat, to reflect, and to remember him often. What do I mean by this? Well, let me tell you. I want to give this in the context of women, which are the majority in the room, but men too can absolutely benefit from this too. I want to channel a practice of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even before he was a prophet, we know that he would go and isolate and take moments of pause and respite in the mountain called Jabal al nur the mountain of light, in the cave of Hira, Lar Hira. And he would do this so often. And before prophecy came to him, he would increase and increase the time. It was like he knew something heavy was coming and knew to take pause and needed to really reflect mindfully every day. After becoming a prophet, he then had a tradition called i'tikaf, or a spiritual seclusion. And this is one of his sunnah mu'akkada, confirmed sunnahs. Why am I mentioning this? I find as women especially, many women have never tried the process of i'tikaf. You ask many women, in fact, if you don't mind, if I can ask this very room, how many of the women in this room have done i'tikaf in their life? I literally am counting five hands in a crowd of 1,500 people. <laughs> May Allah bless you all. We are going to change that together. Here's why. As women, especially, taking time aside from your busy life, the children, the career and the work, the cooking, the cleaning, the chores, the chauffeuring the children around, or whatever it is that might be happening in your life, or even as a busy student, if you do not take rest and repose, it will catch up to you and have an effect on your mental health. And so we as women actually have an option in our tradition to actually do i'tikaf in our very own homes. For me, this has been a life-saving practice, literally. It has been so important for me to take pause in my own home, on my own prayer rug, in my own room, every day. Even if it's just moments in the day. Let me tell you why. One of my teachers says, and you see this picture of a pressure cooker. How many of you cook with a pressure cooker? How many hands do we have? MashaAllah. Some people are happy with their pressure cooker. Many people are quite scared of the pressure cooker. Personally, as I was growing up, I would go to visit my grandmother's house, and she had the old version of a pressure cooker, you know, the one that can explode. <laughs> and it did. And as children, we would see in her kitchen on the top of the ceiling, uh, you know, the effect of the pressure cooker that exploded, and she never used it ever again. One of my spiritual teachers says, the valve that allows the steam to go out is what helps the pressure cooker not explode, right? She says the valve is like the i'tikaf. If you do not have a release valve, all of that pressure continues to build and build and build from your life every day. Eventually you may explode or implode. It becomes so important to have these times of khalwa, as in to say isolation, even moments Personally, I tie this to my daily five prayers and sit after my prayers for a few moments and just contemplate. Practice contemplative meditation, tadakkur, tadabbur, tafakkur, muraqaba. These concepts from Islam which may be familiar to some of you. The reason I'm emphasizing this is again, whatever tradition you come from and whatever you may call this mindfulness meditation, or maybe you practice this in some other form, taking pause is universal and needed, and especially as women. We must reflect and think about what is happening in the societies around us, the individuals in our life, even people that have given us grief. And I remind you a very important lesson. In the Qur'an, we have the concept of Fir'aun, Pharaoh. 
as one of the most oppressive, if not the most oppressive person that's ever come to the be. And I remind you, and our teachers say, if you practice this kind of atikaf, this kind of spiritual seclusion, and you reflect deeply on your relationship with God and your relationship with people and your relationship with society, suddenly you come to realize that even Fir'aun, Pharaoh, had Allah above him. And it shrinks down everything back to real size. Our problems that seem really big start to shrink down to real size again. It is powerful, and I encourage it for you. Make it a habit to reflect and to contemplate often. And I also th remind you that this concept of if you seek out help, seek it from God. And there is no harm in seeking help from the people who God have put on our path. And I also want to remind you this Islamic concept that if bad was going to come to you, it was meant and it was written. And if good is coming to you, that too is written. And no one can interfere in the fate of God is our Islamic belief, which is important because it gives you a sense of relief and lack of anxiety because you know that God is in charge. So now my question for the audience. Take a look, please, at the slide. I have a question for you. It's multiple choice, and I'm curious why you would think this statement would be inappropriate. It says, Muslims do not get depressed, and if they do, they just need to pray more. What do you think the answer to this would be? I'm getting cues in the audience saying, D, all of the above. And you would be correct. It is true. It's problematic to say this as a blanket statement. It's also problematic to say this and suggest that religion is enough. It's also a problematic to disregard mental health services and care, and actually to make sure that we use both aspects. And now this brings me to the last part of my conversation about stigma and the importance of understanding what stigma means and the cost of it. We can't afford to have stigma. It is at three levels. The first level is looking at this from the perspective of your community. If we have misinformation about mental health, if we are unequipped with information on mental health, if we have any sort of lack of access to care and resources or discrimination as in to say, if I were to say something, I'll lose my job or stability. This is reasons why people stay away from getting help even though they need it. If we look at it from a relationship aspect, sometimes people isolate or they have family conflicts or they don't have enough social support. This too causes stigma. One time I met a patient of mine and I said to her, what is it that took you so long to come for care, for therapy and help? She had some very serious trauma. And she said to me one time, many years ago, I was sitting with a group of people, women, like in a woman's you know, gathering, and had nothing to do with her. She heard, overheard two other women talking, you know, as they are, chit-chatting and two other women talking, and one said to the other, oh, did you hear that so-and-so started to go to therapy? They're not talking about her, they're talking about somebody else completely. She's overhearing them. And the other woman says to her, oh yes, she must be crazy. And so the woman who became my patient later said inside of herself, well, if that's how they talk about our friend, I'm definitely never going to therapy and getting help. That kind of stigma is dangerous. Literally, she just overheard a conversation and prevented her from getting help when she needed to get help, worried about what people are going to think of her. Even we do this on an individual basis. We say this about ourselves. We'll say things like, I should be strong enough and do this on my own. I should have better self-esteem. I can do this on my own or I'm simply just going to make dua and read Qur'an. And this is problematic too because our tradition is twofold as we mentioned. It's just plain dangerous. And I hope that we're able to move past this because the cost of mental health stigma literally costs us lives and people. After I've shared with you all of these hopefully helpful things, but also heavy and difficult things, 
I'd like to share a solution. I don't like sharing difficult news about mental health and telling you all the statistics that are increasingly worsening without giving you a sense of hope and where to go next. Personally, in my journey, I've been thinking about what does it mean to actually be able to move the needle forward? How do we make better steps and measures? To do this, as you've seen in my slides, I've looked into my own tradition, the Muslim tradition, the Hadith, and the Qur'an. And then I started to look into our Muslim scholars. I'm very passionate about uncovering this history of mental health from the Islamic tradition. You know why? Because when I was growing up, I never heard anybody speak about the connection between mental health and Islam. In fact, I didn't even know we had a history related to mental health. And it wasn't until my own training and my work in the community as I was serving as an ustada and teaching that it became clear to me that there are mental health concerns, but I didn't know how to address them. I wasn't trained in counseling. I didn't know how. And when I entered into medical school, I planned to do something completely different than psychiatry, subhanAllah. But Allah, we plan, Allah plans, and Allah is the best of planners. And I was pivoted, pivoted into psychiatry yet didn't know anything about this field and had a lot of suspicions about it because all I had heard of was Freud. I wasn't too keen on Freud and a very Western Eurocentric kind of concept of psychology. In so reading about the early scholars and their writings that quote the Hadith and the Quran, many of which I shared with you today, I also came to understand that they created institutions, not like you think of today, not asylums, like you might think of institution today, no. I'm talking about centers, centers of healing. The Arabic version that I'm going to tell you is Darul Shifa. I know you have one here in Malaysia. But today, the Darul Shifa here in Malaysia maybe is much more related to the, only the religious and spiritual. I'd like to share with you a concept that's much more holistic and integrated. It has the spiritual, but also has the biological. It has the emotional and the mental. The Persian word for Dada Shifa is Bimaristan, Bimaristan, shortened as Maristan. And this is the name of the organization I helped co-found. And I'll share with you where women fit into the story in just a moment. But what are these centers? Dada Shifa literally translates into a center of healing. How were they healing the people around them? Because again, they heard the hadith. To every illness, there is a treatment or cure. And mental illness was no exception to the rule. My newest book is on the topic of Madistans. Inshallah, it'll be published in the next few months. Please keep me in your prayers. And the work and research we were able to show is that, yes, all civilizations had hospitals. But it was the Muslims who were the first, to our research and our knowledge, in human history to bring psychiatry to bring mental health into the hospital. That's powerful. And that's an important part of history that I personally didn't know. It took a lot of research to figure this out. Why am I so impressed by this? Because of the holistic nature of healing. They did not discriminate between physical health and mental health. Just like they had surgical wards, internal medicine wards, ophthalmology, obstetrics, they also had psychiatry. And the way in which they treated the patients in these in centers is actually holistic. They had pharmacies and medicine. They had physicians and nurses. They also had spiritual leaders, like today we might call them chaplains, to remind the patients to not lose hope in God. And the ways in which they treated the patients were very holistic. Yes, they used medicine, but they also used talk therapies. And no, talk therapy was not invented in Europe. The early Muslims worked heavily in the topic of talk therapy. My paper is on Abu Zayd al-Balqi from the 9th century, talks directly about the forms of talk therapy that he talked about for obsessive compulsive disorders and phobias. It is fascinating. And it is very much similar to the cognitive behavioral therapies we might use today in the 9th century. Also, they paid attention to all aspects of healing, even the architecture. When I think about Islamic architecture, I think of geometry, I think of ihsan, excellence. Paying attention to every curve, 
Every arch, every dome had a purpose and a spiritual significance. They had fountains because they knew the healing property of water for cleanliness, but also the listening of the sounds of water. They used music, and our newest paper on this topic is giving credit back to these early scholars that used medicinally used music therapy for the treatment of psychiatric conditions. They use color, they use sound, they use diet, dietitians, to make sure that what was eaten is healing to the patient because food can heal you and it can harm you. They also made sure that everything was clean and hygienic. This very multidisciplinary care center called the Madistans of the early Muslim history, in my humble estimation, needs to be revived once again and bridged to modern science and psychiatric care and the advances because we take all those advances, welcome them. But there's something missing in the modern psychology and psychiatry fields today. There is a brokenness in the field that can be bridged with a more holistic tradition. So where is the role of woman in this story? It is imp incredible to me in my research, as I was writing about this, it wasn't until I traveled and took my sabbatical and started going across the Muslim world to visit the Dara Shifaz, the Bibaristans. And it wasn't until I reached Turkey, because Turkey had the latest right, of the Muslim dynasties, the Ottoman Empire, and so many of these institutions are still standing today. And it was incredible to me how many of these healing centers were founded, funded, or endowed or designed by women. One of their sadaqa jariyas, their ongoing charities, was in healthcare and in education. And they cared deeply about leaving something behind that was still going to give them merit and hasanat, good deeds, even after they've long passed away. They were key donors and supporters in the endowments and the awqaf of these institutions. We women have a role to play, and I hope you'll learn more about this institution of healing because I do believe that it is a way in which we can move forward and start to bridge the very fragmented way of healing that we think about mental health today. I hope the way we heal is more holistically moving forward. And with that, I introduce to you our organization called Madistan. It is still in its early and humble beginnings, but there is much to be gained already from the work that we've done whether it's our YouTube channel, whether it's looking at the trainings, the, the publishings that we're able to have. We have a guidebook, for example, for those who care about Palestine. We have a mental health guide. We have another one specific to students, and you can download them directly from the website. We've written khutbas for the khatibs of the Jum'ah prayers on things like mental health or suicide response, already written correctly with all the Islamic rulings of a khutbah, and all the scientific understandings. These are free and accessible to you. Please join our healing circles and our learning circles because it is in these types of resources that bring a very holistic understanding. We hope and pray that there is going to be more benefit coming forward. We hope that many of you will benefit from these resources and actually be able to complement the work that is happening here in Malaysia. And so as I close, I want to give my thanks to the Ministry of Women, Family, and Community Development for taking on this discussion on mental health and wellness, especially amongst women. And there are many principles that they guide their work. I'm very honored and excited to help complement the work that they have been doing in making sure that we're able to move the needle forward for positive and excellent mental health care and empowerment for women. And with that, I thank all of you. I want to make sure you have resources. These are your resources here in Malaysia. Helplines and information around mental health, and you're welcome to scan the QR code. If you're thinking of how do I access mental health care for my families and my loved ones here in this country, there are some excellent organizations and work that have already started. I hope you will benefit from them too. And with that, I thank you greatly. I thank all of the audience. And I thank Our Majesty the Queen.
Um, most probably, there are a few questions by the floors from the audience in this ballroom to Dr. Rania. Assalamualaikum, uh, Dr. Rania. My name is uh, Azlina. I'm from. I'm a teacher educator from the National University of Malaysia, and uh, I'm beginning to notice um, in my um, educational institutions that there are more and more of our students uh, who suffer from mental health issues. In each cohort, there'll be one or two. Uh, who has mental health issues. And um, one of the things that I find is that it's either that they tell us personally that they have mental health issues, or the other thing is um, it may be manifested through their poor academic performance. So um, as an educator, I do not feel equipped to um, guide them in terms of mental health issues and very often we refer them to counsellors. But my question to you is, how do we as educators and uh, particularly in uh, educational institutions create spaces uh, to um, discuss about mental health issues and to destigmatize mental health issues uh, among our students? Thank you. Thank you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for the question. And here I'd like to share with you a pot potential resource for you. In the organization I mentioned earlier called Madistan, we have a program specifically for students. It may be a benefit for you to look at how it is that we've been addressing this. It's called MMHI, or Muslim Mental Health Initiative. The reason we took on this initiative, which actually you can find a branch of it in Stanford University where I'm located, also the University of California, Berkeley nearby, and the reason we actually put these on college campuses and in other educational institutions is because we are noticing that mental health conditions, especially after the pandemic, have A, gone up, B, the generations coming forward are more willing to speak openly about the issues related to mental health, and, or as you mentioned, it may just show up in their academic performance. However, there wasn't really a space for this kind of work, or the students had their own stigma, as we talked about, from seeking out support and care. So one of the things that MMHI program does is provide psychoeducation, education around mental health. Open, and we have this regularly, talks and webinars, seminars, classes related to mental health, normalizing the discussion. Even some of the students on my campus at Stanford University made a video, the Muslim students made a video, where they went around from student to student asking, have you ever had a mental health challenge? And some of them started to tell their own personal story if they were comfortable, but it encouraged other people and normalized the conversation. The program also brings in counselors because we noticed they weren't accessing the mainstream counseling services on the campus. They wanted somebody from their own background culture and faith, and that was very helpful to integrate Islam, in this case, because they were Muslim students, into the therapeutic process. Once we instituted the MMHI program on the campuses, suddenly we started to see people were accessing the services. In fact, every slot for counseling was taken, and we increased the number of counselors and increased the number of services because we saw the uptake was happening better. Sometimes you have to create space and create the normalization in order for the students to actually start to respond. So I hope that is helpful to you and the MMHI program is available on the website to look at more deeply, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank you for this wonderful presentation that uh, really we are uh, learn a lot about this uh, topic. I'm Adil Bahamid, ambassador of uh, the Republic of Yemen in Malaysia. And by provision, I'm a medical doctor and a teacher of uh, community medicine in the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, actually, there is one point I want to raise here about the prevention. Prevention is better than cure, as they said. And I think as an, in the national level, there is a real need. I'm not just talking about Malaysia, but 
maybe about my country and many other countries, whether Muslim or non-Muslim countries, we need a lot to do in regards to prevention in order not to reach to these psychiatric diseases or illnesses or all these problems. Uh, so, so that's why I think there is a real need in order to design a national program for prevention and also for empowerment and mental wellness. And this one will need the efforts of everybody in the society, not only the Ministry of Health or those who are related to the medical issues, but also the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Media, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, and everybody on the, should be on the board. So I think it's time to design such a national program that will prevent the new generation from getting uh, to these uh, illnesses and diseases. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya halab ahli Yemen. It's wonderful to have you here and ask this question. And I absolutely agree that prevention is better than actual um, having an illness and then needing to treat it. This is very true. From the public health framework, we understand that if we are able to do prevention, we won't actually go all the way down the line or as far down the line in order to then treat the conditions that have worsened over time because there hasn't been direct help early on. Even early intervention is better than later intervention. So what do you do for prevention? In the model that we have, I shared a little bit about the model of Madistan as the, as the healing center. Something I didn't share, which is very important to me, is there are two branches to the work we do. One is educational, because that is where the prevention work happens. It is getting down into the very communities. It is training our imams. We have an entire training just for our ustadas and ustadas on suicide response, for example, and other mental health conditions, because we know they're frontline responders. We also have these webinars and learning circles related to this topic, because if you can have early detection and early intervention, you are much better apt. The second half of the work, two parts, is clinical, because then you need to have implementation of the theoretical education and research, there must be direct implementation. But I agree with you greatly that having a national prevention work will go a very long way. So thank you for this. Thank you, Dr. Rania. And we still open to the floors for the Q&A session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Rania. I don't know whether you remember, I was a student at CMC and um, you are a wonderful teacher. Thank you. <laughs> My question is, after I got back from CMC and I got more directly involved in counselling and um, psychology in Malaysia, after talking with many counsellors and psychiatrists, I realised that many of them are shy or reluctant to use our Islamic universal values in their treatment. There is this um, unconscious or maybe conscious resistance because they were never taught this. I mean, for me personally, I didn't even know about our rich traditional heritage of, of Islamic psychology until I went to CMC. So I appreciate this resistance, but I would like, you have a much more wide exposure and experience. How do we encourage or reassure our counselors and our psychiatrists to come out of the closet and really make use of our own tradition, because most of our clients are Muslims. Yes, we are a multinational uh, country, but you could say safely, 60% of the clients are Muslim. So it's very, in my opinion, shameful that the Muslim psychiatrists and counselors dare not use what is an indigenous uh, psychology that we have in our hands. So, Dr. Rania, if I can have your comment on this. Thank you. Salam Thank you. Alaikum. Engaging from the applause of the audience, I think many agree with you, SubhanAllah. 
I first have to say it's wonderful to meet our students wherever we travel. CMC, for those who may not know, is Cambridge Muslim College, and it has a diploma on Islamic psychology that I'm fortunate to teach in. And so it's wonderful to have students, even from Malaysia, subhanAllah, every cohort has had Malaysian students in it, and it's wonderful to have them. Alhamdulillah. What you speak to definitely speaks to me, because I entered into the field with a lot of suspicion and trepidation because I wasn't sure what psychology was exactly and came to it very late in my training. I had already trained in the classical Islamic sciences and so for me, my first question was, well, what did Islam have to say about all of this? So I went about it the other way. For many people, the very first thing they do is they're in the psychology programs that are today modern psychology is Western psychology. It is coming from a Eurocentric frame. It has its biases and limitations. And there is a lot of benefit, no doubt. But there's also blind spots and limitations. There isn't enough adaptation to cultural and religious norms. For the students, or for the clinicians rather, that you are mentioning who feel a little bit hesitant or shy about using religion in psychology, I want to share with you. And here I share with you as a professor and as a researcher that there is an entire emerging subfield of psychology called RNS, Religion and Spirituality in Psychology. There are so many papers and research studies and experimentations that are showing the direct impact of spirituality and religion on one's mental health and well-being. As in to say, even Western psychology is catching up with the concept of integrating religion and spirituality into care for more holistic care and background. So it is not just the Muslims. I'm actually part of a team nationally in America of made up of people from Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist backgrounds who are all looking at spirituality from their different perspectives and making sure it is integrated in. Again, universal power for this. So I encourage you to understand that the wave of psychology as it's moving into the future is becoming more inclusive. It is actually saying, look, if we're going to bring all of our identities to the table and we are people who are coming from a faith-based, God-centered identity, then that too is an identity that must come to the table. You don't check God at the door before therapy. And you don't say, this has nothing to do with us. The reality is, all humans have a soul, have a ruh. And even if the field of psychology today has become soulless, as in to say, they no longer study the soul as they once did early on, because they can't reproduce it and touch it. But Allah told us this in the Qur'an, that the Prophet Muhammad was taught, they will ask you about the soul and say, it is a matter of my Lord, I've only given you but a little bit of knowledge. But at the end of the day, all humans have a soul. And so the concept of Islamic psychology is to bring the soul back into the discussion of psychology so that it is much more holistic and well-rounded. So I encourage everyone here who's listening and interested, if it's piquing your interest, take a look at what Islamic psychology has to offer today. It is a reviving and emerging field that I think is going to be an excellent way of addressing mental health conditions in Muslim majority contexts but actually universally, inshallah. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rania, uh, we, are, uh, we are running out of time, so we give one final question for the floors, for the audience in this room. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. Rania, thank you so much for your uh, knowledge, alhamdulillah. I think I asked this question on behalf of um, teachers and educators in this room. Handling the current generation, the Gen Zs, the TikTok generation, <laughs> I think uh, many of my, my colleagues and teachers and fellow educators can agree with me that it is a challenge. And what is your advice with your expertise, doctor, to handle the mental health of this small range of 10 years old to 16 years old, but the most challenging age group in this world? <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And yes, it is true. And there's, you know, there's so much discussion around Gen Z and now Gen Alpha and the discussions on all these different generations of people and what that all means. I'll say this in brief. I may have a different perspective, actually, on Gen Z. 
I know as educators and even as parents, I have children in this age group myself, and it is challenging. It is, in fact, challenging. However, I have to say that I am impressed with their willingness and openness to talk about mental health and mental challenges, to talk about vulnerability, to talk about difficulties and normalize it and not shame each other or hush each other because they have said it is difficult. Where they will look at even Olympians who've taken a break for their mental health condition and say, good on you that you've prioritized your self-care before a medal. The reason I think that this is important is because it is different than previous generations. They are difficult in their own ways. They came through the COVID pandemic era. There are different issues with socialization and other aspects that we as educators and parents might find challenging. But I think we should capitalize on their strengths. Look at it from a strength-based perspective as opposed to the opposite. Look at what they can offer versus where they're challenging us. Take the willingness to be vulnerable and to talk openly about what is difficult and channel that into help and resources. Make sure that you give them the confidence and the ability to say, you and I can get better and that you are, meaning the Gen Zs and Gen Alphas, are the future of our countries, of our civilization, literally. And if we can empower them with this so that they're not as fragile as they currently are and they're not as self-centered <laughs> as unfortunately the TikTok and social media world makes people to be, you can empower them to become those leaders as they emerge into from adolescence into young adulthood and actually use that willingness, openness, and vulnerability to be better parents, to be better employers and employees, and to be better servants of God. I believe this firmly. I actually have a lot of hope in these next generations, and I hope, inshallah, that we, the other older generations can look at them for their strengths and be inspired by them as opposed to challenged by them, inshallah. <laughs>